yes yeah in the last class what we have discussed ma in the last class what are, what is the aim of the silkworm breeding what are main objectives of the silkworm breeding and where it first domesticated the silkworms and how to improve the quality and quantity of the silkworm breeding at silk all this we discussed and along with that inbreeding outbreeding also we have discussed inbreeding types and uh, along with the examples we discussed in the last class in the yesterday's class today once again i will recapitulate and uh, then i will go for the next topic okay first one silkworm first uh, domesticated in the china 5000 years back 5000 years back domesticated in china and then it spread to all over the world from china to all over the world so what is the importance of silkworm breeding so as you, all of you know silkworm will give you silk so most of us uh, will prefer the silk cloths so to product to improve the productivity of the silk and the quality and quantity of the silk also important that will be maintained by using silkworm breeding so yesterday we discussed some objectives of the silkworm breeding first one is we have we should improve the egg laying capacity we should improve the egg laying capacity of the silkworm and the second one we should take care of the health condition of the larval stage health condition of the larval stage and next one is quantity of the cocoon we should we must and should maintain the quantity of the cocoon if the quantity is good and sufficient then only we will get the sufficient quantity or good quantity of silk from the cocoon okay and the next one is the disease resistant silk worms we should main we should use if you use the disease resistant see silk seeds or silk worm then only we will get the good quality next one what is the meaning of uh, inbreeding inbreeding is nothing but mating between the closely related animals mating between the closely related animals that is called inbreeding outbreeding means the mating between the unrelated animals that is called outbreeding in the inbreeding different types are there one is outcrossing cross breeding interspecific uh, hybridization all these three types are there in the inbreeding so we discussed in the last session outcrossing means what crossing between the animals of the same breed animals of the same breed but they doesn't have the common ancestor that is outcrossing so they belongs to same breed but they don't have the common ancestor that is a outcrossing so cross breed means what one more so here in the cross breed superior male will be crossed with the superior female which belongs to two different breeds so as opposite to the outcross so next one in the interspecific male and female both belongs to yeah it's a theory class ma don't be confused okay sericulture in the interspecific hybridization male and female both are belongs to different breeds but they belongs to same species in the interspecific hybridization they belongs to same species but different breeds okay right next one uh, example for the interspecific hybridization is the mule and the henny so mule female donkey and the male horse will be crossed in this then you will get the mule so generally in the inbreeding what is the disadvantage what is the advantage of this inbreeding we discussed yesterday class once again i will recapitulate so in the inbreeding pure homozygous forms you can get 
homozygosity will be increased in the inbreeding whereas in the outbreeding the homozygosity will not be uh, uh, that much uh, up to the level and the heterozygosity will increase in the out, outbreeding and what are the disadvantages there in the inbreeding and outbreeding in the inbreeding if the homozygosity will increases as usual then the reproduction capacity will be decreased that is called as inbreeding depression inbreeding depression and one more advantage of this inbreeding is we can retain the desired character and at the same time we can eliminate the un undesired character in the inbreeding so one equation one equation also we discussed in the last session then uh, let us discuss uh, i will show you one ppt for this uh, overall uh, session c1 wait a minute uh, i'm sharing that yeah this one silkworm generally the larval stage of the silkworm we will use for extracting the silk larval stage okay larval stage we can use so in this uh, different uh, types of uh, silkworms are there yesterday i told you one is one among them is a mulberry tussar eri mulberry tussar eri these three are the types of uh, silkworms and uh, in the mulberry itself again we have types that is bivoltin univoltin and polyvoltin depending upon the silk present we will dis uh, we will discuss later regarding this type okay so generally larval stage we can uh, use for the extracting the silk the scientific name of this uh, silkworm is bombyx mori what is that bombyx mori so what is the food for the uh, bombyx mori or the silkworms generally they will eat the mulberry plant leaves mulberry plant leaves or some uh, some of the uh, silkworm moths they will suck the juices from the uh, mulberry plant also so generally mostly they will eat the leaves of the mulberry plant okay so uh, just now we discussed this mulberry silkworm types univoltine univoltine bivoltine and polyvoltine so this univoltine it is restricted to europe it is restricted to europe univoltine restricted to europe this uh, one type of silk generally this uh, univoltine silk will be extracted during the winter season by cross fertilization so this univoltine silk we will get only once in a year only once in a year we will get whereas in the, that's why it is called uni uni means single uni means single that's why it is called as uni voltine and next one bivoltine this is a one more second type of a mulberry silkworm so generally you can see this bivoltine in the china japan and korea china japan and korea generally this bivoltine from this bivoltine mulberry species you can extract the silk twice in a year twice in a year you can extract the silk so next third type is polyvoltine so generally this polyvoltine you can observe in the tropical regions tropical regions so in this the female laid by the eggs uh, eggs laid by the female and that will be hatched for up to 9 to 12 days then only you can extract the silk from the cocoons of this uh, bombyx uh, this mulberry silk okay next one 
next one so this uh, genome of this uh, silkworm first sequenced in the 2004 in the year 2004 genome sequenced uh, silkworm of the uh, genome of the silkworm first sequenced in the 2004 but the completion of the sequencing it's over by 2008 2008 total the genome size of this uh, silkworm is 432 mega base pairs 432 mega base pairs so in this diagram you can see different types of uh, silkworms bombex mori tassar munga bombex mandarina so these are the different types of silkworms silk moths okay in this uh, culturing uh, extracting of the silk from the cocoons is uh, called as sericulture so this uh, sericulture first started in china and uh, spread to korea japan india and later to the all the world so first species extracted uh, the silk first species uh, is a bombex mandarina from this bombex mandarina silk moth first extracted the silk so that's one more name is there for the silk uh, fibers that is queen of the textile industry it is also called as queen of the textile industry so queen of the textile industry that is a one more name here so in which country first it is uh, domesticated in china 5 years back so later it spread it to korea japan india and later to the rest of the world okay next so the sericulture different types are there first one larval stage how to extract the uh, silk from this see here if you see first one is a larval stage first one is a moth silk moth it will give it will lay the eggs on the surface of the mulberry leaves it will lay its eggs on the surface of the mulberry leaves and later from this eggs one larval stages will come out one larva will come out from this eggs generally the main work done by this uh, larva is it will 24 by 7 it will eat the mulberry leaves it will eat the mulberry leaves so after eating the leaves up to 20 to 35 days after eating the leaves up to 20 to 35 days it will undergo farming the cocoon so by making the silk surrounding itself its body it will forms one cocoon so this cocoon will be later this cocoon will be immersed or submerged into the hot water so what is the main purpose of immersion of this cocoon in the hot water what is the main purpose so to kill the larva which is present inside it to kill the larval stage which is present inside the cocoon we will immerse it into the hot water so if it is not done if you are not kept in the hot water it will come out the larval stage or the moth will be come out and the threads will be broke down so the length of the threads will be broke down and it will disturb the silk extraction so that's why we will immerse or submerge in the hot water so then the larval stage will be killed so if the ones the larval stage will be killed we will extract the silk from this cocoon so this is these are the different stages present in the extraction of silk from the silk moth any doubt up to this any doubt see here very interesting one these are the different cocoons and the different uh, uh, microorganisms which we disturb the uh, silk worm 
so uh, one virus is the bacterial um, the silkworm quantity and the quality will be improved by gene modification we can improve the quantity and quality by gene modification genetic technologies for this uh, genetic technologies we will use the baculo virus this uh, baculo virus will be used for this uh, genetic recombination technologies okay next so the desirable gene will be inserted into the baculo virus this is the baculo virus into this the gene will be inserted so these uh, steps involved in this incubation culturing and all these uh, no need to discuss here we'll discuss later and a very interesting one is two types of proteins are present in this uh, silk two types of proteins that's why it is very strong the silk thread is very strong so two types of photon what are those fibroin and the sericin so fibroin and sericin are the two proteins present in the silk these will make the silk thread okay so if these two proteins are present in sufficient quantity that a smoothness and the moisture reaction wicking improved in this okay good quality of silk contain these two types of proteins fibroin and the sericin so generally some uh, house flies some other insects they will disturb the silk production by destroying this once again i will show you the ppt see here so these are the ppts related to your uh, chapter these are the moths diagrams uh, types of different uh, silkworm moths are there bomb box to tassar munga and all these things so this is the sericulture procedure how to extract the silk from the silk moth so in the first is first step silk moth will lay the eggs the, from this eggs after hatching the larval stage will come out the larval stage in the larval stage the silkworm will eat the larva will eat completely the mulberry leaves it will depends upon the mulberry leaves Twenty to thirty-five days. This uh, larval stage undergoes slowly into the cocoon formation stage. So, into this, uh, for the completion of cocoon formation, it will takes almost three to seven days to complete the cocoon. So, if the once uh, cocoon will be formed, that cocoon stage is also called as seed stage. Cocoon stage also called as seed of the silkworm. so this seed or the cocoon will be immersed in the hot water that a seed will be immersed in the hot water to kill the larval stage or the silkworm which is present in the cocoon so if once the larval stage or the moth will be killed inside the cocoon then we undergo for the extraction of silk from the cocoon so if we will not do the step we will not do the killing of the cocoon or the larval stage after the maturing it will come out of the cocoon it will break down the silver uh, break down the silk fibers so that will damage the silk formation so that's why we will kill the uh, silk worm which is present inside the cocoon okay these are the so genetically modified proteins by using the baculo virus see here two types of proteins are present in the silk fibroin and sericin so this fibroin is the major structural unit of the silk structural unit of the silk is the fibroin so this fibroin fibers will be attached together by using this sericin protein fibroin fibroin proteins will be attached together by sericin then it will make the silk 
so you are seeing here how the fibrins and uh, sericin attached together to make the silk fiber is it clear so different uh, methods are there in this and next one so here one more interesting uh, one scientist according to scientist lee according to scientist lee five quantitative measurements should be there for the silk five quantitative steps or character should be there for the silk according to which scientist lee so i will write on the whiteboard here what are those five characteristics see here first one is we should maintain the proper egg color egg color so first character according to lee scientist we should maintain is egg color second one is larval markings larval markings so generally in the larval marking stage we will mark this larval as p plus and p so p plus and p we will mark the larval stages so according to the scientist lee two type five major characteristic we must and should follow first one is egg color second one is a larval marking third one is third one we should maintain is blood colors blood colors determined by different genes color sir color difference must and should maintain so generally independence genes yellow color and white color we should maintain yellow and white we will find out in the silk so first one first character is the egg color we should maintain second one is larval marking third one is a blood blood colors that means color of the silk worms first one is yellow and second one is a white and fourth one is fourth character we should maintain is cocoon color what is the color of the cocoon cocoon color so this is uh, this is the fourth character according to the lee scientist so color of the cocoon and one more last uh, character he mentioned is cocoon shape cocoon shape shape of the cocoon so generally what is the shape of the cocoon we will find out generally we will find out elliptical shape elliptic elliptic shape of uh, cocoons we will uh, find out elliptic so these are the five general characters uh, given by the lee to maintain the good quality and good quantity of the silk from the silk worms what is the first one egg color color egg color second one is larval markings sir generally the genes and the marker as p plus and p and the third character is different colors denoted by different independent genes sir like yellow denoted by capital y and the white denoted by the small y capital y and the small y so marking a red color marking so fourth one is cocoon color so this cocoon color also uh, major indication of the good quality of the silk cocoon color next one cocoon shape i already told you shape of the cocoon generally it is elliptical in shape elliptical so this elliptical shape of cocoon will give us good quantity of good quality and good quality of silk so according to the scientist lee we should maintain this uh, quantitative characters uh, how many quantitative characters are there five characters are there first one is egg color second one is a larval markings third one is a blood colors fourth one is the cocoon color and the fifth one last one is the shape of the cocoon so these are the major quantitative characters given by the scientist lee so remember all these things very very important
नेक्स्ट वन वॉट आर द डिफरेंट ब्रीडिंग मेथड्स आर दे ब्रीडिंग मेथड्स सो इन दिस ब्रीडिंग मेथड डिफरेंट टाइप्स आर दे बेस्ड ऑन द सेक्स डिटर्मिनेशन बेस्ड ऑन द सेक्स dominance based on the sex in the uh, incomplete dominance all those things so in this let us discuss what are the steps are present in the breeding what are the steps so take one female which contain the gene n i g 1 take one uh, female silkworm that contain gene what type of gene n i g 1 so it will be crossed with the male which contain the k and k k and k so cross may female which contain the gene n i g 1 with the male which contain the gene k and k so after this we will get the progeny this progeny stage go for the back cross in the back cross so after the crossing the female and the male which contain the different genes we will get the progeny by using this progeny again go for the back cross up to nine generations so go for the back cross up to nine generations back cross in the sense what so we will cross this progeny along this uh, progeny will be crossed again with the one of the female parent female progeny will be crossed with the female parent that is called as back crossing so approximately nine generations will be crossed so that will give us good quality of silk okay so this is about the today's class in breeding out breeding and their differences and their uses all those things so next one according to the lee how many characters uh, we should quantitative characters are there and the what are, what are the breeding methods some more other methods are there in the breeding so we will discuss in the next class by that we will end of this uh, chapter okay so once again i am uh, reminding you silk contain two important proteins fibroin and the sericin so these two proteins will give strength to the silk so by this uh, i am wind up the session uh, some network issues uh, are there here so i am winding up the session today for today that's all okay if you have any doubt amukta maleda any doubt do you have any doubt amukta maleda if you have any doubt ask me i will give you clarity okay there is no question from our side so i am wind up the session for today there is a lot of uh, disturbances there here